All right, we're talking Denver Broncos football on the Our Lads Football Network, Our Lads Football YouTube channel. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And if you're a Denver Bronco fan, uh, then you know that Chris Thomason is going to be with us here to uh, preview the season for Denver, talk about the uh, camp battles that took place, and uh, also update uh, the latest uh, possibly on the final cuts, which are going to be coming down the pike here in just a matter of hours. Uh, Chris, thanks for doing this again. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. I know it was uh, tough, you and I. I don't think we've had a, a tougher time putting this together over the last few weeks, but we finally found an opportunity to get it done. Perfect timing just before the cuts. So let's go right after that, uh, Chris. Let's talk about uh, are, are what specific final cuts would, are going to be the hardest for Sean Payton and, um, and George Payton to make in the next few hours? Well, they're kind of loaded at wide receiver and uh, – there's going to be some tough cuts there. I imagine they probably end up keeping their two rookies, Troy Franklin and Devon Velle. But, uh, you know, there's some solid wide receivers who are on the bubble. You know, Brandon Johnson, little Jordan Humphrey, who both were on the roster last year. Jalen Virgil, who was on the roster two years ago. So receivers going to be tough. And uh, cornerbacks going to be tough because they had some – good young guys that have stepped up. I mean, Chris uh, Abrams drain a draft pick. I think he makes the team, but uh, at the expense of who Jamari Mathis hurt his ankle on uh, in Sunday's game. So, uh, you know, Sean Payton said it's not serious, but maybe he's a candidate for the short term IR because as you well know, there's a new rule that on Tuesday, the day of the cuts, you can put up to two guys, on the IR and they would miss at the uh, – they would have to miss just at least four games and possibly could be back after that. Previously, if you put a guy in IR before the final 53 was said, he was definitely out the rest of the season. So, uh, you know, that's added uh, some extra spots for um, the Broncos – so you figure if they put two guys there, they're up to 55. Then they've got two guys that are going to go on the pup list in uh, Drew Sanders and Delaron Turner Yale. So, you know, that's up to 57 they can keep. But every and everybody else probably then gets exposed to waivers or is outright released if they're a vested veteran. Uh, which of the <clears throat> college free agents – the ones that were not drafted, which have any of them uh, look good enough uh, that they're going to be considered for a roster spot? Well, last year, the Broncos kept four of those. Wow. This year, Lavelle Bailey might be the only one with a realistic chance of being an undrafted free agent who makes the 53. He's a linebacker out of Fresno state. He uh, was up and down yesterday. He, uh, both Sean Payton and he admitted he had two terrible plays on a late drive in which uh, they resulted in gains for the Cardinals. They, they beat Arizona 38 to 12 yesterday. And then lo and behold, he grabs an interception and turned <laughs> to 94 yards for a touchdown on national TV. And there's a massive celebration in the end zone. So he certainly has a shot of making it at inside linebacker. And uh, he certainly got a lot of pub with his interceptions. So if he were to get waived, who knows? Uh, another team might pick him up after that. But uh, he's really probably the only one. I mean, Blake Watson is a running back who's going to be waived most likely and go to the practice squad most likely. Okay. But, uh, other than that, but other than that, there's I wouldn't say there's any candidates for the 53. Any surprising veteran cuts or trades, including maybe uh, Samaji Pirine? Yeah, I don't think Samaji Pirine would be a surprise. They didn't play him yesterday. Wouldn't be surprised if they're looking to potentially trade him. I mean, at running back, it seems like there's three guys that they will keep, and uh, that will be, of course, Javante Williams, Jaleel McLaughlin, and Audric Estime the rookie out of Notre Dame. 
And I mentioned Blake Watson going to the practice squad, Tyler Beatty going to the practice squad, Samaji P. Ryan, if they can't trade him, he potentially could just be an outright cut because Estime, the rookie from Notre Dame, he kind of matches a lot of his skills, not quite the pass receiver that uh, P. Ryan is, but they would save $3 million by letting P. Ryan go. Yeah. That's uh, writing on the wall right there. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the quarterback position. And Bo Nix has obviously had himself a hell of a preseason and more more than likely kind of felt that the job was eventually going to be his at some point this season. But I guess he's looked so good so early that it was just inevitable that he was going to be the man. So uh, let's start with Nix. Uh, how do you think he's looked? Are you surprised that he's looked so good? And uh, what else does he have to do to improve himself and what you've seen? I was a little surprised that he initially looked so good because Jared Stidham had been the leader throughout spring and training camp. And then they go into the first preseason game and Bo Nix, he had a couple incompletions, but after that, he just took off. He showed poise and then he was even better in the second preseason game against Green Bay when he completed eight of nine passes for 80 yards. But when he went into the Green Bay game, I mean, the job was already pretty much his unless he totally fell on his face. He's showing great poise. Um, You know, with any rookie, he's got to learn to earn the trust and become an immediate leader on the team of most guys who are older than him and then also Sean Payton has mentioned some things about his footwork and and that sort of thing but uh, we'll have to see how he looks when the Seattle game the opener arrives on September 8th because he's going to be thrown into a hostile environment with the 12s up in Seattle I mean obviously in the preseason he had one road game it was at Indianapolis but you're not going to run into a raucous (laughs) crowd in the preseason no. lots of empty seats so he's uh definitely going to be thrown in the fire early all right and so speaking of stidham uh is he is he a is he a lock to make the team i mean i heard some you know he wasn't obviously wasn't very happy made some comments i'm sure coaches might say that's what i want to hear i mean i'm glad he's not happy i don't want him to be happy uh do you suspect that that's that's all that is and that he's definitely entrenched as the veteran number two uh and then also uh zach wilson i mean i'm a jet fan so i know that zach wilson more than anybody and i was very happy to see what i saw only in preseason games i have no idea what went on in practice but he certainly looked pretty good in the preseason so i was glad to see that the kid's got a great arm i think if he's around sean payton for a few years and i'm not sure he's going to be but i think if he was that's just going to be great for him so uh it's did him definitely entrenched as the number two well backing up a little bit sean payton said they definitely will keep three quarterbacks on the uh 53 man roster and uh, you mentioned stidham being unhappy I mean, he came out and said, I'm a starting NFL career quarterback, which I thought was a little bit odd for a guy who started four games in five <laughs> years. I mean, yeah. that, that's a bit excessive. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it was quite obvious, even going into the Green Bay game, that Bo Nix was going to be the starter. And uh, I, I, I guess, you know, word didn't reach Mr. Stidham until late. But uh, his comments, you know, were strong, stronger than I might have anticipated. Uh, but the backup job, he hasn't announced it yet, uh, Sean Payton. So we'll have to see. I mean, they've got uh, two weeks of practice before the opener. And uh, I presume he won't be announcing that until a couple of days before the Seattle game, if he even does uh, announce it. Uh, you know, Zach Wilson really came on late in the preseason and, um, he looked very solid against the Cardinals there. And, um, you know, one reason they liked Stidham also is because of him being the veteran and being able to work with young Bo Nix in the quarterback room. So that's just important for the uh, Broncos as him potentially, being ready to come out of the, the bullpen. Is there any chance that Zach Wilson will be with the Broncos after this season? 
after this season? Yeah. I mean, I would think the only chance that happens is if Bo Nix falters and doesn't look great and they tell Zach Wilson he can compete for the job or if if uh, Bo Nix, you know, certainly nobody hopes this happens, you know, sustains uh, some sort of injury that might limit him moving forward. But, uh, you know, we'll have to see. I yeah. mean, if, if Zach Wilson sits on the bench all year and doesn't see any action, I don't think his preseason performance, et cetera, he's not going to break the bank and maybe he'll think he's progressed so much in practice with Peyton that he's willing to come back on a backup type salary and because Peyton is making him yep. a better quarterback and he's exercising his patience and then potentially comes back as the, the definitive backup. And then, you know, Stidham is moving on. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, what about, uh, let's stick with the offense, Jamonte Williams, because there's a lot, a lot of, uh, I know a lot of people thought, well, okay, this is now that second year after the injury. So they're expecting a lot from him. But I, I've been hearing conflicting reports on whether or not he's actually looking good. So is he looking more like the player that they thought they had yet? Or is there still some worry that he's ready to be the man? Well, Sean Payton raved when he showed up for training camp, stating he'd lost weight, looked swifter. Williams said he lost 11 pounds uh, by uh, watching his diet. He... Uh, toughest thing he did he said he gave up snacking on talkies so uh basically Peyton raved about him from day one because there was plenty in training camp I'm saying because there was plenty of speculation after Audric Estime was drafted oh this guy could replace him in the lineup and Williams played in two preseason games the first one at Indianapolis you know he was okay but then I think he solidified the starting job in the second one against Green Bay had three carries for 17 yards, caught a 15 yard pass. So he's definitely the starter and Estime hasn't torn it up in training camp and the preseason. He lost a fumble in the preseason opener that was returned for a touchdown. So yeah, Javante Williams is definitely the starter and Jaleel McLaughlin is change of pace guy but he's become a more physical back so he might be playing more i would think this season than he did last year as an undrafted rookie but uh, we'll have to see how williams does i mean he closed last season with a number of games in a row in which he wasn't even averaging three yards a carry if yeah. that continues going into this season you, you know certainly they'll look elsewhere all right uh tight end dulcich uh another player coming back from injury uh, what's the status there? How's he looking? Well, he looked okay. He, uh, he changed his gait the way that he ran during the off season, and uh, he missed 15 games last year with hamstring issues. Seven the previous season, and there was lots of talk about, well, are they going to give up on this guy? Are they going to draft a tight end, which they didn't. And uh, overall, he's looked uh, fine. But, you know, he's going to have to prove that he can play a number of games in a row to stay healthy. And uh, Adam Troutman is the starting tight end. He's the guy that kind of gives them the best mix of blocking and catching. They don't have a great wealth of tight ends who are good blockers. Dolchik is still working on his blocking and Lucas Kroll the number three tight end is a good receiver, but hardly a great blocker. They've got Nate Atkins, who's the number four guy. He probably makes it. But here's the interesting thing about Atkins. There's some speculation that maybe the Broncos don't go with a fullback. Uh, throughout his career, Peyton has always had a fullback. He likes Michael Burton a lot, but Nate Atkins potentially could duplicate him. He did line up at fullback in the preseason finale against Arizona and then caught a touchdown pass. So that's going to be interesting to, to watch what he does about with the fullback position and whether he maybe uses a tight end in Atkins at that spot. Okay. Uh, next up is the receiving core. So Mims, uh, a lot of people uh, would expect that. All right. Yeah. This rookie season, typical up and down, up and down type of season, but it's year two. Let's get going. The guy is, you know, playmaker, uh, all this talent, uh, but uh, 
not hearing any really positive things outside of Denver from where I, from where I'm at. So is that the case? Has he struggled a little bit? Is or or is he okay? Well, last year, as you well know, he looked really good in games at the start of the season and then mysteriously was hardly used at all. A few targets and week by week, Peyton said, oh, we got to get Mims more involved and it never really happened. And then he pretty much uh, said the thing in uh, the same thing in like three different states earlier this year. He said it in uh, Indianapolis at the Combine. He said it at the owner's meeting in Florida and he said it in Colorado. Oh, we got to use Mims more. And uh, he, you know, he had an okay training camp. He didn't have any really great. He caught a one yard touchdown pass in the first preseason game. So one would think they're going to try to use him more, but there is a crowd at wide receiver. I mean, they did lose Jerry Judy, but they get Tim Patrick back from missing two years due to injury. And he's been looking good. And they signed free agent Josh Reynolds. And of course they have hold over Cortland Sutton. So, uh, there's still a crowd at wide receiver and, uh, we're going to have to see how those uh, number two, three, and four guys sort out after Sutton. And if Mims is the number four guy, he's not going to get a lot of targets. And so far, uh, nothing, uh, nobody's broken out as far as anybody outside those main receivers, those top four, including the two rookie draft picks. Uh, I mentioned Devon Valle. He's been intriguing. Six foot five guy, great range. He's an older rookie, 26. Um, I think he makes the team, but again, he's a rookie, so there's a crowd of wide receiver. I'd be surprised if he uh gets much playing time, but hey, you never know. And then Troy Franklin went in the fourth round and he didn't exactly wow folks in training camp, but they made such a big deal out of trading up for him on day three of the draft saying he should have gone in the second round. He played with Bo Nix at Oregon. He should make the 53. I talked to him after the Arizona game and he told me he expects flat out to make the 53, but he's a guy who's probably going to be inactive a lot. Okay. The offensive line and the real big question is right down the middle. So is this just, Hey, is all this is all we got? We're going with it, or has somebody, whether it's Wattenberg, has somebody like uh, taken that position, this stranglehold on that position? Yeah, I'm the center. I'm the starting center, and I deserve to be the starting center. Yeah, Luke Wattenberg sees the job. He um, took over. I mean, a, a bit of a surprise considering that Sam Mustafer, with 44 career starts, was signed as a free agent a lot of people thought okay well he's going to be the guy but uh, he's been running number three the entire um, spring and training camp in preseason and it would be a surprise if he even makes the team and Wattenberg just kind of took control he started being the guy in the spring and was pretty much the first team center throughout the preseason and training camp didn't play in the preseason finale so he's the guy who's the starter and then they also have Alex uh, Forsyth, who, of course, uh, played with Bo Nix at Oregon, but they've been working with him also at guard, so he might be more of a, a utility guy, but Wattenberg certainly looks like the guy. Uh, are they in trouble if there's an injury or two on the offensive line, uh, or do they have adequate depth? They're in trouble. They don't have that much depth on the offensive line, and you could see that at times during – the preseason with the reserve linemen. I mean, against the Cardinals, Zach Wilson was sacked four times and uh, often faced a heavy pass rush. Um, they were very fortunate last year. They had virtually no injuries on the offensive line, and everybody started every game until the finale when Mike McGlinchey sat out with a rib injury, but they were already eliminated from the playoffs then. And they also had a seasoned veteran, Cam Fleming, last year as the swing tackle, and then he filled in for McGlinchey in the last game. They don't have that solid veteran-type swing guy. They did sign Matt Pert. Who, who might be the uh, swing tackle. He played for the Giants, but, you know, had five or six career starts in, in four years or so. So there's not much depth at all in the offensive line. 
Defensively, uh, let's take a look here at the depth chart, the Orlando's depth chart, and the pass rush. We talked about the good, young, inexpensive uh, edge rushers on this team, and then they go out and get Jonah Ellis, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I saw him make a play in that Colt game. But uh, talk a little bit about uh, this defense, uh, especially the front seven. Uh, how confident are they that this front seven is going to be better than last year? Yeah, let's talk about the defensive line first. I think that was the thing that they beefed up the most during the offseason. They added John Franklin Myers as a defensive end, and he was he's the most key addition, I would say, to the team in terms of, you know, excluding drafty Bo Nix. And uh, then they also added Malcolm Roach, a free agent who had played for Peyton previously at New Orleans, and he's a very versatile guy. He'll spell DJ Jones at the uh, nose tackle position, but also can play the ends. And then the other starting end would will be Zach Allen, who had a really nice training camp in preseason, and he's starting to really come into his own his second year in the Denver system. So defensive line looks good. And uh, the outside linebackers are solid. I mean, uh, we've talked about them before. They got three young guys in Jonathan Cooper and Baron Browning and uh, Nick Benito. Benito had some back issues during the preseason, but overall looked pretty good. And uh, then Jonah Ellis, whom you mentioned, a bit of a surprise that they took him in the third round, but they thought he was just too good to pass up. And he had an excellent preseason, so it's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, I mean, he's going to be a key guy on special teams, but it'll be interesting to see how much they incorporate him on defense. So that's four guys, so they're in pretty good shape, even if they were to have an injury or two. And Thomas Inku made the team last year as an undrafted rookie, but he's definitely on the bubble this year. Okay. Uh, inside, Cody Barton is the new face. So uh, they're pretty happy with what they got there, Singleton and Barton? Yeah, yeah. Cody Barton, he was battling Jonas Griffith. He missed all of last season with a torn ACL for the job at inside linebacker. But Barton seized it, although he was the only likely starter who played in the finale against the Cardinals. I think they wanted one final look at him but he seems to have passed all the tests uh so he looks uh decent uh jonas griffith uh i mean another veteran type and then uh we mentioned justin starnad who's more of a special teams guy and then we talked about lavelle bailey so uh yeah i mean Josie Jewell was a big leader on the team so that was a loss in terms of leadership on defense, Alex Singleton is going to become more of a leader, and he'll wear, he'll wear the green dot, calling the defensive plays like Jewel did last year. And uh, we'll get to the secondary in a minute, but then they also lost Justin Simmons, so that's kind of an issue on defense. Who's who are going to replace the leaders in Jewel and Simmons? Yeah, and speaking of Simmons and that position there, so uh, Brandon Jones comes over from Miami, and then, of course, uh, P.J. Locke is there. J.L. Skinner, uh, a little banged up last year. I talked about when we uh, went over the draft last year, talked about how much I liked him at Boise, didn't know whether or not he was a tweener, didn't get a chance to play, not sure how he's looked this preseason. So without Simmons, how does that safety room look? Well, they like the signing of Brandon Jones, but he sustained a hamstring injury, missed a couple of weeks of training camp, and then, as it turned out, never got into a preseason game. And Vance Joseph, the defensive coordinator, flat out said his missed time was a concern because the safety position, as you know, relies on a lot of communication and not having him out there, especially for any games at all and for a lot of practices. He... Um, expressed some concern but brandon jones said after the game on sunday he considers him himself fully healthy ready to go against seattle so he's one starter pj Locke is entrenched at the other starter he did some good things last year Locke has vowed to be more of a leader i mean he's been around denver for you know five or so years and but last year was the first year he really got any uh, reasonable amount of playing time from scrimmage and then uh the reserve skinner he's been up and down he didn't play much last year he's been making he's got a lot of talent but he's been making a lot of 
rookie mistakes, penalties, things of that nature. And then the last spot seems to be a bit up for grabs. I mean, Devin Key could be the guy, but Hedron Smith, who plays both cornerback and safety, could possibly squeeze in for that last safety spot and with key maybe then going to the practice squad smith had takeaways in each of the three preseason games he had an interception the first one an interception in the second which he returned 56 yards and then a fumble recovery in the third so he's a guy that just seems to always be around the ball all right, and then uh, we take a look at the corner position. Of course, Sertain's there, one of the best in the business. They look pretty good at the nickel, and they also added uh, Abrams Drain. Uh, we talked about him earlier. Uh, so they seem to have uh, their uh, nickel position uh, set. Uh, Moss, uh, this is going to be uh, an opportunity for Moss. Uh, is he the? Is that the position? Mathis, you talked about him being a little banked up. Is that really the uh, the, the one position to look at at, at corner that is going to be uh, you know the pot- a potential issue or concern? Um, Moss didn't play yesterday against Arizona. I kind of consider him the leader in the clubhouse. You might say for the cornerback spot. They had on the depth chart listed, this is the right cornerback spot ap- opposite Pro Bowler Pat Sertan. They had listed on the depth chart Moss and Mathis as an or in between. Moss has seized, has gone ahead of Mathis, and then, of course, Mathis getting hurt. Now now he's unequivocally ahead of him. The wild card in this is Levi Wallace, who – Looked to be the leader potentially for the position early in training camp. Then he hurts his hamstring, and he's out two weeks. He missed the first two preseason games, and then he finally played against the Cardinals starting. So, uh, you know, he's got uh, two weeks now to have some spectacular practices if he has any hope of unseating Moss to be the cornerback. But as the Broncos have stressed, just because you start week one you're not anointed the starter for the entire season I mean last year Mathis started the first six games and was pretty bad they started one and five and then he was replaced with Fabian Morrow so uh I mean Moss is the leading candidate to start week one but that doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way the whole year yeah he was uh, a really good player at Iowa and they can definitely uh, pull in some good DBs, and there could be a load of them this year, too, to keep an eye on for next year's draft. All right, special teams, the kicking game. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, – so how's that punting situation? Well, um, Trent Gill has made a, a, a late run. I mean, it looked like Riley Dixon might be the guy, the incumbent, for a while he got all the punts against Indianapolis in the first preseason game when they actually didn't punt as much. He only had two. And uh, then Gill, his first couple punts in the second preseason game were nothing impressive. And then he just started booming the ball. He had a 60 some yarder against the Packers in the second preseason game. And then he booms a 73 yarder, in the final preseason game, it went into the end zone, but Hey, it's still 53 net. That's not too bad. Nope. So uh, it's gotten intriguing and uh, they have to make up their mind here by Tuesday. I mean, they save seven, $800,000 if they go with Gill, the cheaper option. And another thing that's interesting, if you go with Dixon, He's a vested veteran, and then his contract, his contract, which is you know a million and a half or so, becomes fully guaranteed after the first week if he's still on the roster. And ah. let's say, let's say he, you know, they want to replace him, you still got to pay him. Versus Ooh. Gill's a guy you can cut any time and not have to pay him. So I'm wondering if that's going to come into uh, consideration. But uh, in the preseason, just looking flat out at the numbers. Gill was the better of the two punters. Okay. Well, and then throw in that money. And that's definitely a factor. Or at least you would believe it would be. Okay. And Lutz, uh, uh, do you th- is the staff pretty confident uh, being a veteran that he's going to be able to make the big kicks when they need it? Yeah, they, they like him a lot. I mean, uh, 
there was a big kicking battle last year in training camp, as you remember, and then boom, it ended when they acquired Lutz from New Orleans, who previously kicked for Sean Payton. And then he flirted with uh, Jacksonville in free agency. They were willing to give him a three-year deal, and he looked like he was about to accept. And then the Broncos uh, swooped in and kicked in a little extra money on a two-year type deal. So uh, he's their guy. Peyton's used to him, so that's that. That definitely uh, accounts for something. And Mims, at least I guess in a worst case scenario, while he is trying to get his bearings as a receiver, uh, we know he's really good in the return game. So uh, he's definitely return man number one. Correct. One would think so. He didn't get many returns during the uh, preseason, but the Broncos didn't show anything, as a number of teams did. I mean they. I don't know what their strategy will be in, in week one. They're they're working on it, no doubt, behind closed doors when the media is not watching. So uh, both return and kicking off. I mean, we're gonna ha- we're gonna have to see. But one would uh, assume that Mims would be the primary kickoff guy because obviously. He led the league. He didn't have enough attempts to qualify, but led the league last year, if he did, in yards per return. So it would be kind of foolish not to throw him back there. But you need another guy back there as well, and that's wide open because certainly the other team might just try to kick the ball away from Mims. And then if they are kicking knuckleballs and grounders, we'll have to see – what Mims' uh, shortstop skills are like in scooping them up. Yeah, this was uh, an interesting preseason when it came to that new kickoff rule. It just seemed like, for the most part, you saw a lot of kicks in the end zone. Uh, we didn't learn anything, or at least I don't think we did. And you're wondering whether or not, oh, well, are they just saving it for the regular season? Uh, yeah, so- yeah, I, w- I would think so. I mean, I was excited to watch the kickoffs in the preseason, but then they turned out to be incredibly boring. Yeah, uh, there was there was nothing to them. And then late in the preseason finale, the Broncos were just kicking it out of the end zone because that was one additional play that somebody could get injured on. So, th- I mean, they've got Mike Westoff, 76 years old, one of the great special teams guys ever. He's uh one of you know uh, one of their uh, special teams coaches and uh, uh he's going to come up with something i mean uh, <laughs> and they got Ben Codwick who's a special teams coordinator i mean they've got something that they're going to come up with and there's going to be some uh big time surprises i would imagine in week 1 chris what's your uh what's your best guess on uh your feeling about this football team year two sean payton they got the rookie quarterback out there though but look we saw cj stride have a successful run as a rookie uh do you think bo Nix could uh, have that kind of run this year and you think denver has a shot uh at maybe uh making some playoff noise this season uh playoffs gonna be tough but uh, i think they'll be better than most have projected i mean kind of the over under victory total that has been thrown out has been five and a half. I think they exceed that maybe, you know, seven or possibly even eight wins like they had last season. Uh, Yeah. The the season mostly hinges on how Bo Nix looks. I mean, if he just gets better and better and better, and even if they miss the playoffs or having a losing record, if he provides great optimism for the future, I think that will uh, excite the fans. Um, One good thing is that he did so well in the preseason and he won the job easily. It wasn't a case of he and Stidham were dead even, and then it was a tough decision, goes down to the wire. They took Knicks, and then then maybe he doesn't get off to a great start. Did they make the right decision? So this is a guy that they're going to roll with. All right. And again, want to remind everybody that uh, you can catch uh, Chris's work at the uh, gazette.com uh, for the Denver Gazette. Uh, are you, did you put your, uh, well, uh, you're going to have Denver, um, sure, Denver Gazette.com. Denver Gazette.com. And uh, yeah, matter of fact, let me see here. Let me put this over here, pop this up. And this is actually, uh, you can see here, 
this is just one of the um, stories here that you were working on uh, following the game uh, that was just last night uh, with uh, Jared Stidham being very disappointed in losing the quarterback battle. You also have here some of the work here all the way down the line. So you could check out uh, Chris's work here again at denvergazette.com. And uh, Chris, uh, do you have any podcasts that you do on your own or do you just pop up now and then on interviews? Uh, we'll have podcasts posted on the Denver Gazette website throughout the season, you know, usually one every week. All right, Chris, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for hanging in there with me, putting this together, and I look forward to talking to you during the season. All right, thanks for having me on there, Greg.